Potential Theory in Two Dimensions In the early 19th century, scientists were beginning to observe a new force they called electromagnetism. Ben Franklin defined positive and negative charges to be a property of matter that allowed it to interact via electromagnetic force. Over the next few decades, people like Coulomb, Faraday, Cavendish, and Poisson developed the idea of an electric field. Let's drop a negatively charged particle at the origin. We can visualize it creating field lines in all directions that will affect any nearby particles. The lines indicate how any other negatively charged particles will be pushed by the EM force. For this video, we'll be working in two dimensions, so imagine all our particles are in a flat plane. Let's consider two particles with one at the origin and the other at a distance r. What's the force between them? This is like asking how strong is one specific field line. We can draw a little circle around the origin and draw a bunch of field lines as they pass through the circle, and the sum of the field lines passing through this boundary is called the flux. Now Gauss's law says the flux is proportional to the charge inside the circle where epsilon naught is about 9 times 10 to the minus 12. But since all the field lines must be the same, the flux is also equal to the integral of a constant E across the boundary. So E times 2 pi r is equal to Q over epsilon naught, or E equals K over r, where K is a constant, combining all the other constants. This is the two-dimensional version of Coulomb's law. In three dimensions, the force would be k over r squared, and the rest of this presentation would follow with a few changes. In the 1820s, a young man named George Green was working in his father's mill. And despite having almost no formal education, he took up the study of calculus and attempted to apply it to electrostatics. In his 1828 essay, he declared he would, quote, submit to mathematical analysis the phenomena of the equilibrium of the electric and magnetic fluids and to lay down some general principles equally applicable to perfect and imperfect conductors. His method was to track down a function he named the potential of the system. Sadly, Green's work was largely unknown in his life. He only sold 51 copies of his essay, mostly to friends who didn't really get it. But after his premature death, Lord Kelvin found a copy and expanded on it. The essay includes what is now known as Green's Theorem for Multivariable Calculus. I want here to trace the basics of Green's work. In particular, I want to show how we can work out how an electric charge will distribute itself on a conducting plate. Laplace, known as the French Isaac Newton, studied fluids that are irrotational and incompressible. Think of this as a fluid where at every point the amount taken in and the amount given out are the same. There are no sources during new force, no sinks absorbing excess, and no energy wasted through rotation. In this visual, the fluid passes through every point except the exact center with no gain or loss. Laplace derived a differential equation that expressed this condition. There is a real valued function phi that depends only on the position in space and it solves the differential equation. Phi double x plus phi double y is always zero or in polar form, phi double r plus 1 over r times phi r plus 1 over r squared phi double theta is always zero. A function that solves a Laplace equation known as a harmonic function. For an explanation of why the Laplace equation expressed this harmonic condition, I will refer you to Steve Brunton in the description. Now, the electromagnetic force is not actually carried by a fluid. However, think about our field lines. If we plop down a charge object at the origin, all the sources of field lines are on the inside. Outside of it, there are no other sources. There are also no sinks. Nothing's going to suck up field lines and make them disappear, and there's nothing that will cause them to rotate. So that means that even though there is no electromagnetic fluid, the field lines have the same no sources or sinks property, and we can find a harmonic function that will represent the electromagnetic potential of this charged object. We could track down the potential function using pure math and differential equations, but let's cheat a bit by using physics. The potential will express the work needed to draw the particle close to the origin if it has a charge of 1 coulomb. We say close to because you could never have two particles in the same place. So let's say the closest they get is distance one. 
Does it seem like a cheat? Well, we haven't actually said what distance units are. So we can just define a new unit that has a value 1 when the particles are touching. Now work is the integral of force with respect to distance. So phi of x is the integral from r to 1 of k over t dt. Or k times log of 1 over r. Note that log here refers to a natural logarithm, so base e. And t is a dummy variable representing distance at any specific time. We can quickly verify that this is harmonic. Phi sub r equals negative k over r. Phi sub double r equals k over r squared. And phi sub double theta is 0. We don't want to be restricted to a point at the origin. So we will say that the potential at x generated by a charged particle at t, where x and t are both ordered pairs, is log of k over the absolute value of x minus t. Absolute value here just refers to the distance between the two points. Finally, we can take a charged plate that we'll call E and add up the potential generated at every point. So phi of x equals the integral across plate E of log of 1 over absolute value of x minus t d mu t. Wait, where did that k go? And what the heck is that mu thing? Well, the point is that the charge will probably not distribute across the plate evenly. Mu refers to distribution. Without diving deep into measure theory, the basic idea is that different parts of the plate are weighted according to how much charge they hold. As for the k, we generally rescale the measure so the total weight is 1, meaning the constant multiple gets absorbed into the mu. Now, a basic law of physics is that a system left to its own devices will settle into an equilibrium at the lowest energy state. Think of pouring water into a glass. Over time, the water level will be even. An electrically charged plate must do the same. The energy of a distribution is defined by taking the potential at every point on the plate and adding it up. This can be done by a double integral, but I think it's more instructive to start with a finite example. Imagine we drop two ball bearings with the same charge in a cage. They will naturally push each other as far away as possible. This tells us that the charge on the plate will be entirely in the boundary. As they drop more balls in the cage, they will push each other as far away as possible, and the points they settle at are called the fecata points. The number of connections between n particles is n choose 2, or n times n minus 1 over 2. We want to find the distribution where the average energy of the particles is as low as possible. So take the reciprocal of each distance, take its log, and then average them all together. This represents the energy of a system of n equally charged particles in a certain arrangement. The equilibrium state is found by minimizing the energy, but a few quick log rules show this is equivalent to maximizing the geometric mean. If you're unfamiliar, the geometric mean refers to this quantity, where we multiply seven numbers and take the root corresponding to how many numbers there are. Let's do an example on the unit circle. If you had to guess, how would you space out your charged marbles as much as possible? They have to be on the boundary, so the distance between two consecutive points will always be the same angle, 360 over n degrees. These points are also known as the roots of unity. We can use a little trigonometry to work out these distances and their geometric mean in a few cases. For three points, we get a triangle where each side is length root 3, so the mean is also root 3, or 3 of the 1 half. With four points, we have a square with sides root 2 and diameters of length 2. This gives a mean of 4 to the 1 third. I'm skipping five points because I don't know the cosine of 72 degrees, and I'm guessing you don't either. For six points, we get a hexagon with sides length 1, two triangles with sides length root 3, and three diameters of length 2. Working it out gives a geometric mean of 6 to the 1 over 5. If you like, you can pause and try to work out what you get with eight marbles. The pattern that's revealing itself is that the mean is n to the 1 over n minus 1. We can see how the ball bearings are filling out this boundary. In classic calculus fashion, we can take the limit to infinity and the result, 1 in this case, is called the transfinite diameter. It's not hard to see that if a circle had radius r, all the lengths would scale and the geometric mean would be r. This can be written as tau of e, or it's sometimes referred to as c of e and it's called the capacity. We can then put the log back and get the total energy of the equilibrium measure, which is called the Robin constant, v sub e. Summarizing then. 
If we charge a plate, allow the charge to settle into its equilibrium state, its energy is V sub E, and its capacity is defined as C of E equals E to the negative V sub E. Now let's reframe the question. How much energy does it take to bring a charged particle with one Coulomb charge to the plate? Obviously, it will take zero energy if the particle is already on the plate, so this amounts to finding a harmonic function that is zero on the boundary of E. This is known as the Dirichlet problem, or Dirichlet. The man lived on the French-German border, so both pronunciations are acceptable. Frostman's theorem verifies our water level intuition. The potential at nearly every point on the set is constant, and in fact the same numerically as the Raman constant. I say nearly every because E might have some weird isolated points that the charge couldn't reach, but we'll ignore that possibility for now. There are pure math methods for tracking down the distribution on certain shapes, such as our above circle example, or you could have a computer test many different combinations of points to estimate the minimal geometric mean. Once we have it, we can create the Green's function. So we generate G sub E of Z equals V sub E minus Phi sub E of Z. Now the Green's function is harmonic and positive off the set and zero on the set. And there's one other thing. Let's zoom way out. Out here, the charge plate looks like just a point, and it looks pretty close to the origin. And if that were true, the Green's function would be just log of absolute value of z plus a constant. To be specific, near infinity, g sub e of z equals log z plus v sub e plus error on the order of 1 over absolute value of z. So similar to how the Earth's gravity can be thought of as coming from a point at its center, the EM force can also be thought of as a point charge when far enough away. Hmm. Note here, by the way, z is just a variable. If you're used to using x, I was using z because we are typically dealing with complex numbers here. I want to shift gears now and look at a different problem. You may wonder how computers and calculators can almost instantly evaluate complicated functions. And the short answer is that they don't, but rather they use a polynomial that is pretty close. Polynomials require nothing but addition and multiplication, which computers are great at. Ask any programmer and they'll tell you that one of the main challenges is reducing the memory used in operations. How many flops does it take? In the above example, it takes only two multiplications and two additions. This is a Taylor polynomial. But we're always looking for other ways to build approximations more efficiently, and one way is by using the Chebyshev polynomials. Informally, Chebyshev polynomials are the flattest monic polynomials of a given degree. Suppose you're writing a program where you use fourth degree monic polynomials to estimate between negative one and one. Which one would be the closest to zero? We can see a few examples here. The error at any point is represented by the vertical distance from zero, with the boundaries or domain marked in purple. The maximum errors marked with green vertical lines are 3, 2, and 0.887, respectively. Can you beat these scores? I'd like you to pause and click on the link to the graphing app in the description. Enter into the first box exactly what I have, don't forget the asterisks, and play around with the sliders. See what the flattest polynomial you can find is. The solution in this case can be found with the polynomial x to the fourth minus x squared plus one eighth, and the max error is one eighth. In fact, I'll go ahead and show you the first four Chebyshev polynomials on the set negative one to one. The pattern here is that the error of the nth Chebyshev polynomial is one over two to the n minus one. So the max error is cut in half with every added degree and quickly goes to zero. The challenge is to find Chebyshev polynomials on arbitrary compact set, meaning one that is both closed and bounded. And we like to do this even in the complex plane. Let's start by considering what we know about polynomials. An n-degree polynomial has n zeros, so having them all be simple zeros in the set is a good idea. This forces the polynomial to touch base with zero as often as possible, thus keeping it from getting too big. We don't want any big gaps between the zeros either, since a big gap would allow it time to grow very large. In other words, we want to fill out our domain with zeros in a way that are spaced as evenly as possible. Well, that sounds a lot like the Fecata set. So let's give it a shot. 
What if we return to the unit circle in the complex plane? We want to find a polynomial with complex domain that is the smallest in the sense of absolute value outputs. We'll construct a polynomial that has zeros at the fecunda points. So z minus z1, z minus z2, up to z minus zn will equal z to the n minus 1. This polynomial has a maximum error of 2. If n is odd, you plug in negative 1. If it's even, plug in either i or negative i. For a circle of radius r, it will scale up to 2r to the n. This means that for a circle with larger radius than 1, the maximum error will go to infinity. We now see that sometimes the error can go to 0 and sometimes it will go to infinity. However, what if you take the nth root of the error to get rid of that power that's taking us to infinity? Well, the limit of this new quantity is called the Chebyshev constant, and it'll exist for any compact set. In the first case, the Chebyshev constant is 1 half. Now, for an interval, the capacity that we defined earlier is 1 fourth the length. So, in this case, 1 half. For the circle, we have the Fekita polynomials. And while they're not the same as the Chebyshev polynomials, the nth root of the maximum error will also approach the Chebyshev constant. In this case, the Chebyshev constant is r. In both cases, the Chebyshev constant is exactly the same as the capacity, and this will always be true. The most exciting moments in math are when two seemingly unrelated topics turn out to have a connection. The fundamental theorem of calculus links differentiation and integration, and now the fundamental theorem of classical potential theory links electrostatics and approximation theory. This is known as the FFS theorem also, after Faber, Fekete, and Sago, who developed it in the 1940s. If I've done my job, the results should seem surprising, but not too surprising. While we started with two different problems, we solved both using Fekete points, so we ended up with the same solution. And this theorem opens up a whole new world of problems that are still being explored to this day. For example, what if our underlying set E has a lot of isolated points, say, infinitely many? Now, the Green's function ignores isolated points, but the Chebyshev polynomials do not. And using this fact, I have recently proven that if the series you get from evaluating the Green's function that isolated points diverges, then the error on the Chebyshev polynomials goes to infinity. This is all thanks to the electrostatics of George Green.